I wouldn't sell the farm just yet, but you might want to get it appraised. Number one today is Thursday, September 28, 2023. And this is the week in charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Looks like the numbers are getting bigger and bigger. So somebody's finding a show somehow. I appreciate that. If you're on YouTube, at Dave Landry is my YouTube handle. And you can you can find this shows live on Thursday nights and keep an eye out for other live appearances. You can also attend live by going to DaveLander.com slash webinar. So what can we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks, and attitude versus aptitude, getting out of your head. This was something a little bit last minute, but I think it's very relevant right now. I've got a good example for that. I want to talk a little bit about performance-based metrics. That's my style of technical analysis. Keeping it simple, no complex indicators. And then, of course, if you have any questions or anything, just fire away. So YouTube is at Dave Landry. And then, again, you'll subscribe and you'll get notifications for a live webcast. This is the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's do an update on the performance-based updates. And everything you do, everything I do is performance-based. And I think it was Jeff. Jeff, you're here tonight. Was it you that talked about the 5% zone as a caution zone? So the TFM 10% system looks at the 50-week closing high and then subtracts 10% from that. And I don't know, if, let me just back this out if you can see the parameters. So the parameters are over here. If you have the stock charts platform, this is stock charts ACP. And then my plugin is down here. Just like the video and you'll have access to the plugin. But you can see 50 week closing high, you take 10% away from that. Oh, I forgot to show, show you the parameters. So here's the parameters over here. So 100% would be this top green line, okay? 95% would be this, the top of this pink line. And then 10% of that 50 week closing high would be this red line in here. So here's the 50 week closing high. And as Jeff pointed out a few weeks ago, as long as you're in that green zone, you're probably okay within 5% of that 50 week closing high. And he actually first said, when you drop below that 5%, it's a good time to think about getting out of the way because bad things are beginning to happen. And that's very much true. So that pink zone has become a caution zone. And then, of course, uh, no bueno becomes when you get below that 10% line. And the whole TFM 10% system is a close below the 50-week moving average for exits, that is, and a close below 10% of the 50-week closing high. And then, again, you can see the parameters over here to how to set these charts up so the question is where are we now well we have a new 50 week closing high as of about eight weeks ago and so you are here down in the caution zone i wouldn't sell the farm just yet but you might want to get it appraised where the market becomes to come unglued a little bit like this so we take a look at the bow tie moving averages and i know everybody here your eyes are glazing over because because you know what they are but to those who don't because as soon as i forget to mention what they are somebody's going to ask me but anyway 10 simple 20 exponential 30 exponential and as i said many times before i've learned that the relationship between these moving averages can really help to keep you on the right side of the market and that's also where the bow tie pattern comes from or bow tie setup i should say so you could see this summer was one of the best summers ever the sell in may and go away people were wrong <laughs> wrong and that's why I don't adhere to any market adages religiously. A few years back, I had a bad summer in the trading service, as most summers are a little questionable uh, and, and iffy because the market can be thin and all. But then every now and then you get a great summer like we had, and it, it's just the opposite of what you would think. We had a pretty good run, obviously, from May. You enter a bit of a caution mode when the moving averages begin to meander and cross over each other. And then bad, obviously, is when they're in downtrend proper order. But we went from caution to bad to caution back to good. It looks like all was it looked like all was well in the world. I remember that back then. It was like, okay, it looks like we're gonna be 
in great shape here. But unfortunately, it flipped back to red and then yellow. So when you're going back and forth between yellow and red and yellow and green and back to red and back to yellow and back to red, it's not a good thing, obviously, and the market is choppy. And then now we're back to bad. Now, whatever you do, never forget to eyeball a chart. I took a chart out earlier that showed like we had this retrace and it stalled out. So that's not a good pattern. I'm going to show you Apple here in just one second. But this retrace on the right side of this bigger picture topping formation, this head and shoulders form the second shoulder or the right shoulder, I should say. And it was higher than the left. And each week I say, I'm going to dig out my uh, Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee. And who's the other one? That's um, it's got to be somebody else out there. But uh, Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee are the two big ones that come to mind and take a look at head and shoulders and see what they say about them. But it seems like from years and years and years of looking at charts, I've noticed that those with the right side higher than the left tend to be a little bit more bearish and work out a little bit better. Now, as Dave Keller pointed out in a recent final bar, you have to break the neckline before that becomes official. Just because you have a topping formation doesn't mean the market is topped. And that neckline was about 4350 round numbers. And we did obviously break that down. Keith said he had on six positions, now down to one. Very good. Just following along, letting the stops take you out, right? Good job. And we somehow, knock on wood, managed to hold on to three positions. And I'll show you those in just a minute. Now, the 30 EMA with Landry Light is also a good little illustrator because it doesn't indicate anything. It just shows you what's already in the charts. But every now and then, it can kind of indicate a little bit what's happening. And I want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. But once you get a pretty good trend established, about 20 bars or so of upside Landry Light, sometimes you have nice follow through to the upside afterwards. You can see we went about 50 bars or so. So that's that's a pretty good little run. Unfortunately, it came to the end. Now, an end. Now, the good thing is it came to an end and we really didn't have a significant rally back to new highs. And I'm saying that's a good thing because if you were bullish and then we pull back to the moving average, which is actually a bullish thing, which is a good thing, right? You could say, okay, well, if we start going back up, then I'm going to maybe start putting on shares again or start getting a little bullish again because, boy, that was a great trend we were in. And then the market begins to tank and you start getting downside Landry light, okay? And you can see it down here, highs below the moving average down here. You can see the red beginning to mount. And so it's like, well, hang on. We're starting to get quite a bit of red. Let's look at the net net price change. Where are we now? Where were we a couple of months ago? We're not making much forward progress. You might get a little excited here, but notice you had no follow through to the upside. And then you went back to red, back to none, back to green, back to none, back to a little red. And then now we've got or now we have, in case my wife is watching, she'll correct my grammar, <laughs> about six bars. So again, it was good coming into the summer. If you just eyeball a chart, just draw your blue arrows, or you can look at the bow tie profit order or Landry light. But you can see we did begin to meander back and forth around the moving averages. Again, the net net price change is your best friend in those situations. And you gotta get out of your head, okay? And that's something I'm gonna talk about in a little while but you have to get out of your head and you have to see what is so again we were choppy and now we're back to potentially bad mode with six bars of landry light so here's apple and one thing that i've always looked at and there's nothing new under the sun and and even in in the before we went live i was chit chatting with john and he said that Dave Keller had mentioned me about the Livermore series. And, and uh, fortunately, John likes the series. He said it's fantastic. But there's even within reminiscence of a stock operator, Livermore says that there's nothing new under the sun. Well, if you take that statement, that comes out of the Bible, okay? But one thing that Livermore pointed out was a good little reminder, and I'd already noticed this, is that your your former big leaders meta not so much with meta but a little bit meta's kind of look at toppy in here but keep an eye on on, on your former leaders nvidia and etc 
and I think Apple would probably be the biggest dog in the block when it comes to this. But when they begin to break down from all time highs and they don't come all the way back, that's a bit of concern. You can see we went to bow tie, downtrend, proper order. We retraced up. It has a, a, a bit of a gatekeeper look to it. It's a pattern we don't talk about a lot and trade a lot, but every now and then a gatekeeper will set up. It's kind of cool. And that's when you stall short of those prior highs. So the whole gatekeeper thing, as I'm kind of thinking out loud, is based on the premise that these previous high flyers, they failed to get back to the old highs and roll over. So that's what I figured out empirically, Livermore talked about many, many years ago. But you can see we stalled out, stalled short of those old highs. And so far we've been rolled over. Now, keep in mind, by the way, on the short side, I tend to like big fat issues as opposed to the long side, I tend to like them a little bit more thinner. And the reason I like the thinner issues on the, on the long side, within reason, is you're going to find more of an inefficiency there. You're going to find that stock, I'll show you on one, and not since we've been in it, but right before we got in it, it ran up about 260% uh, or so. And we've had stocks before, not, not all the time. And I, I was working with a client earlier today, and I said, well, you're going to have to be patient. And he came in like right after a big winner, as Murphy would have it. And had he caught that big winner, his portfolio would look much better than it does. But I told him to be patient and hang in there. And, and in some ways, without digressing too far, imagine that me digressing. But without digressing too far, it's probably better for him longer term. I know it's going to sound crazy that he didn't catch that setup because if right out of the box, his first setup would have been a 500% gain, he would have thought, man, this is easy. Let me just step on the gas. Let me tell the boss to F off and so on and so forth. And I've seen it happen before. And I've countless times, I've got, they're just kind of running around in my head. I Like in one case, I know I talked about it last week, but this one particular client absolutely printed money and I was begging him to cash out, leave 100K in and just pay off his condo. And that way he would have, he, if he's that great, he could keep trading. And I was trying to tell him that conditions were such that really helped him along. But I guess experience is the best teacher. So it's better off if you're struggling and you're fairly new to trading. And I heard Linda Rasky in a speech, a little uh, like a little TikTok type of speech or whatever, uh, YouTube short, talk about your first three years as a new trader. You're still trying to figure out everything. You're still trying to learn technical analysis. And she didn't say grail hunt, but there's a little bit of that characteristic there. And the gentleman I was talking with earlier we worked on our system, we worked on my system a little bit, the core methodology. And he's like, well, let me show you what I'm working on. So and I shot a few holes in it, not to pick on him, but it was kind of like, okay, you're off here grail hunting. Make that your kind of side hobby, but separate that out from the trading simplified, the looking at the Landry Light pullbacks and then using the simple money management and taking only those FES setups. I don't, I'll flesh that out in just one second. So obviously with things getting a little iffy, now's the time to think about both sides of the market. And as I preach quite often, especially when the market begins to weaken a little bit, I'm not a huge fan of shorting, but I'm not opposed to it. And we're short KBH. I'll show you the portfolio here in just one second. We have another one we're looking to short too. Now, last week we talked about attitude versus aptitude. And I put out a post in Facebook earlier today looking for something to cover tonight, asking if anybody had anything you want me to cover. And the, the post stuff, for, I didn't hit send or something. I don't know what happened. So I ended up having to put in a post late in the day. And I, di I didn't get that out there. And by the way, if there's anything you ever want me to cover, you could, you could certainly mention to me much earlier than an hour or two before the show. Okay. But anyway, so last week was doing I was working on attitude versus aptitude, and I was going through all the subjects. I've been working on a book for years, and uh, probably got about a hundred typewritten pages. These are all the the topics that I've I have, and whatever I don't know what I'm gonna talk about tonight. I just start flipping through these these cards, and uh, know your guru, trade prayer, ego equity cycle, read this first and last, and I just see if there's something in here that might be worth covering and i found one so getting out of your head so this is the 
the book I've been working on forever. It's actually was another book, which is even bigger. And I started pulling it down a little bit, condensing it a bit, but I'm still at about a thousand pages, uh, handwritten pages on this. And you see a lot of this content in the weekend charts. And, and so it's not, even though it's gonna take me forever to get it out, it's like it's coming out in dribs and drabs here and there. A lot of comments tonight. He mentioned the series is fantastic and your name. I'm saying it's fantastic, just to clarify. Oh, okay, thank you. Cool. So anyway, you're thinking, looking at a setup, you're like, okay, this is a good setup. This is a good idea. Well, you need to get out of your head, okay? And you need to start thinking, this is a good setup because, and I'll flesh this out in just one second. And then you need to ask yourself, am I seeing what is? and what do other people see as i preach we are really greater fool hunters okay somebody has to come along a greater fool has to come along and give us more money than what we paid for the stock they have to buy it at a higher level so i always ask myself is there a greater fool and maybe an even more important question is am i the greater fool because whenever you buy a stock somebody sold you that stock okay and he believes that there is no greater fool and you might be his greater fool now you have to play devil's advocate a little bit okay so you have to say why it might not be a good idea it's like come up with a premise and then work to, be, to pick it apart. Now, something huge I've been working on, and I can't emphasize this enough, is extraneous influences. <laughs> uh, I hate to tell the story again, but it, it just popped in my head. Years ago, I worked at a plant that made transformers, and uh, they weren't very good at it. Uh, and every six weeks or so, maybe eight weeks, management would come down and they get all the plant workers off the line and stop them from making transformers. And they would put up all these charts and show how much money they lose for every transformer they make. And I thought it was kind of demoralizing. Okay, you know, you guys, everyone you make, we're losing $393 on. It's like, well, you know, poor guys on the, on the, on the plant line. You know, why not tell them, like, you're giving power to people and yay, all this stuff is good. Anyway, I almost I always wanted to raise my hand and say, I have an idea. I could save us four dollars a transformer. What if we quit making transformers? But anyway, long story endless. I used to boy, it's it's gonna get longer before I finish. <laughs> I was doing programming way back in the day, and I had to work with accounting quite a bit. We were doing some kind of uh, I forget what you even call them anymore. I tried to forget as much as I could about that job, and that's why I'm here because I that job made me so sick of uh corporate america or whatever plus i'm not good at corporate america but anyway long story endless i swear there's a point to this i would i would call accounting and i'd ask them a question about okay i need this i need to know how to get this feel or where we're populating this and what do you want to do with this and, and so on and so forth and every time i'd call i was trying to get one particular person who i was working with and somebody else in the department would answer their phone and they were like people like in cubicles outside of her office and it drove me absolutely nuts and some people will say it's a short trip and I, I i don't know i might not argue with you too much and i'm like why can't you just let it go to voicemail because if it would go to voice i'm not going to tell somebody sitting outside the office some big long technical explanation about what i need but if you let it go to voicemail i could explain everything i need and whatever and then she could she could call me back even if she gets voicemail she could say no that's fine or no that's wrong or let me show you where you get this or whatever and we could conduct a lot of business through voicemail and so i went up there and i asked them why can't you just let it go to voicemail and one of the ladies says well we answer each other's phone because what if one of our kids breaks a norm at school and i said what does that have to do with making transformers now i knew i was kind of <laughs> tweaking them a little bit but I, there was a little truth in that I was a little aggravated and uh, they didn't like it very much so you need to 
is there a point to all this? Yeah, let me bring it back around. When you're getting ready to make a trade, you need to think about your extraneous influences. What what does this trade have to do with transformers? Okay, what is this trade? What is my being hungry or just have eaten or a fight with my spouse, a fight with my significant other, or a fight with both? Okay, what does that have to do with the trade? What is what is the fact that I just made a bunch of money on a trade and I'm feeling loose and free and lottery rich with my money? and want to spend some in the market because I'm so smart. What does that have to do with the trade? What is even worse or can be, or just as bad, what is, you see the great mother of all setups and not taking it because you lost in the last three trades and you're a little bit gun shy on taking that fourth trade, knowing that it could turn into a losing trade and knowing that it's really going to stress you out. What does that have to do with the trade okay what does that have to do with trading so i call it the transformer test now the bottom line in in trading and in life and trading isn't much like life and that's why it's so damn hard for all of us that's why it's it's still damn hard for me right because things are a little or, or a little perverse when you kind of think about it you're dealing with your own emotions and emotions of all these other people and one way trading is like life is trading like life is making decisions and living with them and it's the living with them that's the hard part the making decision is the easy part and the living with them is a little bit tougher i'm not going to make a joke at my wife's expense because i think she's she's helping with me with the uh, live cast and i, I don't want to lose my assistant here anyway so at the last minute, I just screenshotted a couple of pages that I'm working on, and this has not been edited, obviously, or converted into digital. But you gotta get the idea of what I'm doing. This stock is a good idea because, and there's a, a Landry list. Hey, I like that, a Landry list of things to look for, okay? So I thought this LFMD would make a good example so if you go back to that list of things one of them was okay it's in an obvious uptrend and it's set up it pulled back to the 30 ema that's a landry light pullback you can look down below you want about 20 bars of the landry light pick your favorite moving average i love the 30 ema it's one of my favorite emas i know you want to party with me and about 20 days of landry light is a decent trend but still look at the chart okay because let's say you had 20 days back here and the trend's kind of just getting started back here. So I wouldn't get too excited about this stock, but I might put it on my radar, okay? But you can see we had about 50 days almost, or at least 45 of Landry Light, and then it implodes back to zero when you cross the, or touch, I should say, the, 30 simple moving average. Even though we closed above it, Landry light goes away, goes to zero once you touch the moving average. You see back here, highs are less than the moving average. And the Landry light count here, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it gives you a really good visual representation. In fact, there's some uh, shorter term patterns, just FYI. I think it's, um, I'll have to look up the exacts, but it, but a first thrust or a bow tie will often set up just like this. I think it's just five days of Landry Light to the downside if you're coming off an all time high, kind of like Apple did, would would set up that pattern. And I think I call it the, the first kiss after daylight because Landry Light used to be called daylight until my wife said, after meeting John Bollinger in, in um, in Italy, she's like, who's that? It's like, it's John Bollinger. And she's like, well, who's that? And I said, well, he's he's famous because he he has an indicator with his name on it. She goes, well, why don't you put an, an, your name on an indicator? It's like, all right. I often or occasionally do what I'm told. So anyway, looking pretty good, right? It was a Landry Light pullback. That's one reason I like the setup. The entry was here, the stop was here. The IPT was up here just for reference. Getting back to, I like this setup because, as I said a minute ago, yeah, I was in a gradual uptrend, but then look what happened. 
while you had that Landry light, it began to accelerate higher. Those familiar with some of my patterns from way back in the day, that's accelerating momentum strategy. Also, if you look carefully, there's lots and lots and lots of persistency, meaning that it tends to go up day after day after day. Persistency is one of the most powerful things you could use as a trader, especially if you combine it with acceleration. So that means that people are in a hurry to buy the market and want to just keep buying it, buying it, buying it. And you get that buying day after day after day. A lot of times you'll see me not get too excited about a stock that looks like it's trending because most of the trend was in one or two days. And that just tells me a lot of people rushed in. And then now they're kind of like, what have you done for me lately? Now, another thing I said was I like this setup because the net net price movement was substantial. So you've got about a 200 and something percent move here. Point wise, it's pretty big too for a cheap stock, right? Now, the other thing I said, the volatility is high, but not too high. It's it's on the cusp of being too high because it's it's right around triple digits. Not that I won't trade a stock with a, with a triple digit volatility. I just look carefully at it to make sure what I'm seeing is a really good stock and I'm not gonna get stopped out because the stock is so crazy on noise alone. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret here. If you combine volatility, especially high volatility with structure, and I used to have a name for the pattern, I forget what I call it, but a lot of these patterns that I trade are just similar to other patterns. It's just like the bow tie, I'm sorry, the, the Landry like pullback could be like a generic pullback, persistent pullbacks or pullbacks where you've got a lot of persistency, accelerating momentum strategy, same sort of thing. Yet again, it's a pullback, but you have acceleration. So this stock here has a little bit of all of the above. And the little secret as I let you in on, if you could find super high volatile stocks within reason, but let's say somewhere around that triple digit range in with your 50 day HV, so this one was 95 going into the trade. This is what's called, and, and they put my name on it. I didn't put my name on it. It's called Landry Volatility and ACP if you're using that. But all that is is historical volatility. So I gave them the formula, but I got it from somebody else. And that's just a statistical measurement of volatility. And don't quote me on this. You'll see how little I know about statistics. Besides, statistics are worthless. 73% of all people know that. but if I understand HV correctly, you don't have to, it's like you don't have to understand electricity to turn a light on. You just have to know what it is, right? And that it helps you to get that light on and you need to pay your electric bill. But the volatility suggests there's a two third percent chance that this stock is going to be 95% higher or 95% lower on an annualized basis. So that's how it's acting based on looking at the last 50 days of this stock. Now, you start trying to make predictions off of that. It, it doesn't do you a lot of good, but just know that you're going to need a super wide stop if you're trading something like this with a really high HV. And I think I had the column blocked off, but somebody was asking me a while back, so I added the column to my tracking spreadsheet. And you'll see some of the positions we have like a 12 or 14% stop. And then on this one, I think it was like a 28 or 29 percent stop. And it looks if you think, oh, my God, you know, 30 percent, I can't risk 30 percent on a trade. It's kind of like that you don't get no coke. You know, it's like I can't do that. I can't risk that much. Well, you can by reducing your share size down. And I'll give you the spreadsheet to where you can just punch in your account size, punch in how much you want to risk. And then if you punch in the entry and the stop, it's going to tell you how many shares based on that. And I've done presentations before where I've showed that less volatile stocks are actually more dangerous in that something bad can still happen. It's less likely, but believe me, it happens, okay? And if you've got on a lot of shares because the stock isn't that volatile and you're trying to catch your, you're trying to capture a big move, you want to make sure you've got on plenty of shares based on the volatility, you're going to end up you could end up wiping out an account with even just one position because you put so much of your account into that one position, even if you have that 2% stop. And again, I've showed those those uh, stocks before and it's in presentations where it's better the devil you know. Anyway, I'm kind of digressing here, imagine that. Now, one thing I talked about was, hey, does the sector action confirm? Well, this stock is health services. 
and looks like health services based on the day of the setup was doing pretty darn good. So check the stock, make sure it's an F yeah setup. And again, I was working with somebody earlier, so it's, it's still in my head, but he had, um, I wanted to, he was showing me his, his elaborate spreadsheet, which I was pretty impressed with, but I asked him, where's the F yeah column, you know? So if you're gonna put a, a work on a spreadsheet where you put setups in it, I wanna see a column that says F yeah, and justify that setup in your trading journal with everything I just said about that LFMD, okay? And make sure you're feeling that F yeah feeling, anything less than F yeah pass. And I've been doing that a lot lately, and I know I'm a nerd, but I'm kind of amazed, uh, especially like on the intraday stuff, which I shouldn't be doing anyway. I preach against day trading forever, but hey, I'm here, and every now and then I'll fire one off or 20 off. <laughs> But I've really been cognizant of that F yeah thing. It's like, could I live without taking this trade? Probably. And that's probably 99% of the time. But every now and then, I think it was uh, Sox L today, I couldn't resist it. I had to go in and, and pick up a few shares here and there. So make sure you're feeling that, that F yeah kind of feeling or something close to it at least. A little bit easier for me to show you an F yeah feeling with something like my core methodology that I've been doing for, oh shit, going on 30 years, it's something I've been preaching forever, that it is, it's something that I'm kind of noodling around with, like zero DT options and things like that. And by the way, I, I said I would port, report back on them. I haven't figured anything out yet, believe me, and I'll let you know. Other than, I think if the market's in a route, you can start buying up those out of the money options and flipping them out at a double to get a, a free roll. But that's that has not worked lately it did work pretty good earlier this summer when this market was just blowing and going that's another story altogether but anyway the other thing to ask yourself is hey what's the overall market doing okay so you want your stock to be set up you want the sector to be trending and ideally set up and one thing that i think people might overlook is you also want stocks within that sector to be trending and set up because what you might be seeing is a bit of an aberration. It might have a few stocks in the sector that are moving the, the sector higher. And this is especially true, like let's say you're looking at computer hardware, okay? Well, it's Apple and that's pretty much it. Uh, there's a few other stocks in that sector, at least it used to be. And it's just one or two stocks that's making 99% of the move. So make sure you look a little bit within that sector to make sure you get getting the confirmation. So anyway, big blue arrow in the overall market, check. I miss those I miss those days back in July, don't you? So here's the setup, and this is, I talked about, this is a dead money report in my Trading Simplified show. And you can see, we just kind of meandered back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This position is getting absolutely nowhere. So do you bail out? No, you follow your plan. So at that point, you're thinking it's dead money. Well, dead money by definition, has little or no chances of ever being worth more than it is today. So you might as well get out. Well, the problem is you don't know if the stock is just consolidating and might take off. As long as it stays within the normal volatility that you determine going into the setup, in this case, it was pretty damn big. It was a point and a quarter, if memory serves. We'll take a look at the spreadsheet in a second. So that's a big, that's a big point-wise and even bigger percentage-wise move but that's what it called for. And if you look at the stop down here, it's really not that far away from the entry based on the chart. So you can see that it did go back below positive, at least intraday for a little while. And then it finally took off. And then it hit a new, I think it hit a new closing high today. Again, we'll take a look at the spreadsheet. Now, the other side of this is I showed you the good. Okay, so if everything is good, the... HV is okay. The price movement on net net basis is substantial. The trend is solid. It's accelerating. It's persisting. And by the way, this is sort of this is what you do going into the trade, but kind of see it as a pre mortem to where like pre write your post mortem. So what I'm saying is, after all is said and done, I took this trade because, and these are all the reasons. So you could just cut and paste that to your post-mortem and we i've done a complete presentation just with a pre-mortem so maybe do a search on that now the or would be that it would have to be really great 
looking setup, uh, really great looking FES setup if everything else doesn't doesn't fall in line, all the things we just talked about. As far as the sector and the market are concerned, okay? So every now and then you can get an FES setup in crappy conditions, but that's the exception, not the norm. And I do have a I do have a checklist that's somewhere buried in all this stuff. So all this stuff is not organized at all. It's a lot of work to put it all together, but you can see that uh, I'm going to get there eventually. So there's the portfolio. We have one short going into tomorrow. Most of what we've been doing lately is sitting on our hands. And the people who are going to become successful longer term, and the people who have been in my clients for the last 10 years or more, maybe 20 years. They are completely okay with sitting on their hands because they know that's part of the game. Everybody else is a bit of a junkie and they want setups, setups, setups. And like I told somebody today, it's like you could, I, we could take that learning curve and flatten it out by keeping things simple and being patient when the market's going sideways. Or you can go off to chase rainbows when things are going sideways and then do all your holy grail hunting and everything and then come back to me 10 years from now. And let's go back to this simple, simplified trading. So anyway, here's the LFMD. This is the reason I put this in here. The initial profit target was 550 on that one. That's a 29% gain, but I'm not worried about percent gains. But I know a lot of people like to look at that. And you know, when this becomes triple digit, I do, truth be told, I like to kind of flaunt it a little bit, right? I mean, why else are we doing this? We can't uh, feel good when things are working out. So we've got about $2,300 round numbers in this position. And our stop is now at five, 450, excuse me. And we got in at 425. So barring overnight gaps, we'll make a little bit of money on that second loaf. And hopefully through trailing stops, this number will get much, much bigger. And as will this number here, and then percentages will be really big. That's what we live for is the outlier. The aforementioned gentleman, like I said, he missed that one big trade, which would have put him into the plus column. And I told him, I said, you're really not doing that bad. You're pretty close. He was kind of breaking even down a little bit on, on my trade specifically. But as soon as he hits that one outlier, he's, he's back in black and he's off to the races. All right, any thoughts or questions on any of that? Yeah, thanks for the kind words on the Livermore series. Appreciate that. Yeah, trading seemed easy until September. Yeah, it 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 you know, <laughs> it, it it I was I actually said this earlier too. It's like when things start start working out nicely, everybody's like, oh well, I don't need Big Dave anymore because things are uh, things are pretty easy, and uh, I'm just gonna do that. Okay, let's shift gears and talk about. the uh, crypto. So if you have any individual cryptos you want to look at, let me know and I'll be happy to take a look at those now. And let me shift gears here and get to the, uh, if I can get this out here. Okay, let's do, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on crypto because there's not a lot going on, but just, um, let me know if there's there's something you want me to cover. I'll be happy to cover it. I'm just going to look at, uh, we'll just look at a couple in here and then we'll hop into stocks. And then if you guys want to talk, start talking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Just ask, uh, just put the ticker in and I'll take a look at the stock for you. Uh, if you're watching live on YouTube, I don't have the ability to answer your comments on the fly, but I promise I'll look at them tomorrow. While I'm making these kind of transitions, you may have to join us and go to webinar if you want me to answer questions live. And eventually we'll, we'll work all this out. But for now, we're just kind of in experimentation mode with the live, just FYI, a little housekeeping there. Bitcoin, Bitcoin had a good day. Uh, one of my beefs with Bitcoin was I had hoped, and you know, Marcus, if you hope, you know, there's no room for hope, but I was trying to stop from saying something vulgar. Uh, but my hope with Bitcoin would be like, okay, Bitcoin is just going to mostly go up. And if stocks go down, 
I could just trade Bitcoin while I'm waiting on stocks to go back up and maybe fire up a short or two in stocks. But unfortunately, and I don't have the charts for you tonight, but it's pretty simple to do. On stock charts, you just put a put a, your symbol in, colon, you put your other symbol in the sharp charts, just the original charts, not the ACP. And you get a nice little performance-based relative strength type of chart. And anyway, the point I'm trying to make here, when you when you do that, or if you just simply do an overlay, a lot of times Bitcoin looks just like the overall market. The correlation is often very high. And I I think it was uh, Greg Schnell was talking about, he was bullish on Bitcoin. We were in a bull bear debate. He was bullish on Bitcoin with the caveat that the S&P would have to get over, I forget what it was at the time, 4,000 or whatever, before he would, he would look to buy Bitcoin. So he was doing a little intermarket technical analysis there which I think is kind of cool. Anyway, uh, Bitcoin had a decent day as of now, at least. We're back above the 30, no Landry lights, but at least we're back above the 30. I would not rush out and buy it just yet. Although one thing I have noticed with Bitcoin is it seems like whenever it gets whacked, it comes back quite a bit. And the other thing I've been thinking about a lot, I know I say this quite often, but I just can't get out of my head. There's 21 million maximum Bitcoin, right? And population of Florida is about 21 million. So basically, if everybody in Florida wanted a Bitcoin, they'd be just enough to go around. Or every other person in California, as I wrote in an article probably five years ago. So there's not a whole lot of Bitcoin out there. And I'd be willing to bet in the whole world I'd say most people have heard of Bitcoin in the entire world. And out of those, I figure where we are now, 8 billion, I had to take an elective in college and they're like, when we get to 5 billion, we're all going to die. <laughs> I was like, great, what a depressing <laughs> class. And when we hit 8 billion, it kind of scared me. I wasn't kind of like, ah, we're still alive. It was kind of like, oh, crap, we're supposed to die at 5 billion. But anyway, out of the 8 billion people in the world, you can't tell me there's enough people that would want to buy at least one Bitcoin to absorb the entire supply. And the reason Bitcoin isn't a million dollars is because there's a lot of derivatives out there, a lot of paper Bitcoin. I know I say this every week, but like take a look at gold would be a good example. Gold should probably be a lot higher than it is. I think it's uh, one of you guys, I think said a few weeks back when I asked, all the gold in the world will fit in an Olympic sized swimming pool, okay? In the entire world. And you look at the demand for it, you would think that there would be a lot more demand, gold would be a lot higher. Well, it's all the derivatives out there, all the paper gold, and in Bitcoin's case, all the paper Bitcoin, whether or not that Bitcoin you buy really exists on this on exchange, who knows? Not my keys, not my coins, right? Is what they say. So again, I think the market is is kind of propped up by a lot of paper Bitcoin. And it's almost like a rabbit hole. I don't want to go down because I'm afraid I'll find out how uh, <laughs> how fake it really is, so to speak. All right. So that's Bitcoin. Let's take a look at Ethereum real quick. And I think that's pretty much it. I'll just show you how the... Um, there's really nothing to do. Ethereum's kind of bottoming out in here. It actually looks okay as for compared to Bitcoin, at least. It, it looked a lot worse than Bitcoin. And that's another one you can do with the ratio charts. You can divide Bitcoin by Ethereum or vice versa. Yeah, keep them coming. Keep the stock picks coming. But it's looking a little bit better. I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. It has bottomed out. And oh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention about Bitcoin, just real quick, I think I forgot to say. One thing I've noticed is every time it gets really whacked, the the whales come in and, and push it back up. And then it gets whacked, and there's no guarantee it's going straight back up. But it seems like that's kind of the mode it's been in for a while. It seems like there is some pent-up demand out there. Nothing I would actually trade off of, okay? It's not conceptually correct. It's nothing you can model, but it's just an observation. Okay, let me just show you real quick. As I say ad nauseum, when the market is blowing and going, sometimes you could just come in here 
and this one might be a little thin and maybe that that would be an example but sometimes you just go in here and buy the ones that are just going straight up like that one looks kind of interesting because it's going straight up but we're not in that kind of market but when we get into a nice rip roaring market and i'm kind of surprised that these things are these things are looking a lot better than they did earlier maybe we can start just kind of buying the strongest one my favorite thing to do because it's so damn easy is when these crypto pairs are, are just absolutely running you could just buy the strongest one it's a bit of a bummer because kucoin is you can't use it in the u.s if, if you guys can figure out a way to do that let me know or let me know when they open up the u.s i think the u.s kind of shut them down in the u.s but they had every kind of crazy pair in the world and i really miss i really miss all those pairs and usually you could find something not when the market's really crappy but usually there was something out there and that was a lot of fun back in the day back in the day six months ago all right let's shift gears and go to stocks and then keep your individual stock picks coming uh please and then i'll be happy to take a look at them all right let's kind of plow through this kind of quickly uh let's put the bow tie moving averages in i guess in a 50 simple the i don't pay a lot of attention to the 50 simple and the 200 day moving average they only matter when they matter when the market begins to break down you'll notice i start plotting them more and more especially the 50. But you can see we've got Landry Light below the 50, bow ties in proper order, all the things we just talked about. So S&P 500 still looks pretty toppy in here. Now, if we get back above this 4350 and stay there for a while and consolidate, then I might begin to change my tune a little bit. Let's take a look at bonds. Well, I don't want to, but boy, that is ugly. Look at that. You know, which way is that headed? The big blue arrow is pointing down. A little bit of a bounce today, but so far it just looks like a dead cat bounce to me. And it could probably have the mother of all retraces and still be in trouble. So bonds down, rates up. Uranium has been pretty strong as of late. It hasn't really let me in other than a day trade or two. Some worked and some didn't. But I'm waiting for uranium to pull back a little bit. The spot uranium banged out some new highs with a little bit of vigor today. So that's kind of cool. Here's another spot uranium. Oh, these are the actual miners. This is another ETF for the stocks. Anyway, let's get back to the market real quick. Before we do that, there's Apple again. You can see a little bit of a bounce today, but again, Apple's kind of rolled over. Keep an eye on the previous leaders, like I've noticed before and like Mr. Livermore noticed 100 and something years before me. NASDAQ Composite, a little bit of a bounce, kind of made you top, before, top being formation in place. All those other things I said about the P's apply to the, all the things I said about the P's apply to the NASDAQ head and shoulders top. Euro has been pretty weak. The dollar's been strong. The dog at least flees, I suppose. But you can see the euro's at a pretty solid downtrend. And usually you don't see such persistent trends in Forex. So that's kind of interesting. And the dollar, like I said, has been doing really well. Dollar up. Look at the dollar. If the dollar, God forbid, begins to implode a little bit, then the energies are really going to skyrocket. And that's because it's gonna take more and more dollars to buy energies. And we'll get to energies in one second. Let's take a look at the Russell. Russell just sucks. There's no other way of putting it. The short to intermediate term trend is down. The longer term trend is sideways at best. So that's just a ugly market there. The only glimmer of hope, at least for now, on the long side at least, sands uranium and the in, is um is the energies. And uranium, which you consider, which could be considered an energy, I suppose. But you can see that so far we haven't found a lot of setups within the energies just yet. I found one or two that I was kind of mediocre on. And but I think that if if the market can hang in there, eventually we'll find some setups. And it's just I actually wanted a little bit deeper pullback than what we've had in here. I thought I think it'd be important to knock a few people out. And then look to get in, but I just not seeing a lot of setups there. It's kind of a kind of an odd thing. As you go through these sector after sector, looking ugly. There's financials, real estate. The sector I don't get too excited about one way or the other. But you can see it's down here toward the old lows because it's interest rate sensitive. I'm guessing. Take a look at speaking of interest rate sensitive. Look at the utilities imploding in here. Probably not a whole lot of opportunities there, but it's it's good to see, or it's good to look at everything to see what's happening. 
gold, the commodity, you know, I listen to uh, radio for that uh, mile and a half journey every morning on the way to the gym. And there's one company, I'm not going to point out the name, but he's like, if you're like me, you can't afford to lose 30% of your money in stocks. Well, take a look at gold over the last however many years. It went 20 or 30 years and lost half of its value. Okay. It's like, so yeah, I don't want to lose 30%, but in gold, you might lose, you might lose 50%, you know, in stocks too. All asset, all asset classes at some point in your lifetime, as I preach, and I'm sure when the first person discovered this, so whoever first said it, um, I apologize for not knowing, but all asset classes will lose half of the value at some point in your lifetime. Go back and look at that Bitcoin. It's lost half its value quite often. Defense, boy, that's an ugly chart, huh? Look at that. Serious downtrend so far, just pulling back a little bit. Looks like the next leg there is which way? Lower. Manufacturing kind of topping out in here, bow tie to the downside. MNC with Shark KBH. There's some other home builders out there on tonight's list that are potential shorts. So home builders not looking so hot in here. Shorts are tough. You know, they seem to go against you. And right when you start feeling good, the mother of all rallies comes in and it's just tough. And I've met a lot of people who know a lot more than me about markets. And they all agree that shorting is not the easiest way in the world to make money. But learn how to short, not because it's the only way to make money when the market goes down, but more importantly, it's going to help you to see both sides of the market. As I think I said in the last final bar, my friends who are running a lot, a lot of money, who are long only oriented, they, they tend to be a little bit more glass half full than glass half empty when you start talking about where the market is headed. And usually they're right because in general, the market does tend to go up. As, as you probably know, but you can't hang your hat on that because it also can go down 50% or more and also could take 25 years or more after going down 50% or more to come back. And if you don't believe me, look at the chart. So buy and hold is a farce and, you know, change my mind <laughs> on that one. You're not gonna. I also scored about a zero in agreeableness. So I'll probably argue with you <laughs> quite a bit. I saw a meme the other day. It's like I said something about uh, it's pointless to argue with me because 20 minutes ago I realized you were right, but I'll just keep arguing, and I'm not I'm not proud of that. It's a it's a sickness. <laughs> so okay, let's take a look at some of these stocks. I got a couple of right ends. Uh, A J G. Uh, this is not jumping out at me. I, I see what he's saying. It's like, that's a good looking longer term stock. And I'm not going to say, I'm, I don't know whether I should talk about him or not, but I, I do know someone who who runs a lot of money and they're okay with a with a kind of a boring stock like this and they'll get in and stay in forever. But it's they're running a different kind of fund where they just take these positions and he might actually factor in a few other things. But for me as a trader, an active trader, HV is 15, so that's way too low for me to get excited. Let's just take a look at the P's real quick, and let's see where the where the HV is there. 11, okay? As a general statement, you're not going to beat the market with stocks that are less volatile than the market. Now, that's an okay-looking stock, but keep in mind something bad can still happen, okay? So it's, it's not that volatile, but then look at this little dip right here. That's, um, it's not a huge dip, but it's a substantial dip. And remember what I said earlier, you're gonna have to buy a lot of shares of something that has a low volatility reading in order to make any decent money. So this little spill here could have been really, really nasty. That seems to be uh, an outlier type of pullback for a stock that's not that volatile. So I would pass on that one based on volatility alone. MCK is another right in. Uh, yeah, the this is a big fat drug company, if memory serves. Say drugs down here, our health sector, healthcare. Well, volatility pretty low on that at 22. You know, unless you get a really persistent move, which could make volatility drop off. I don't know the math in that, but somehow persistency makes volatility drop then I would pass on something with volatility that low. Right now, I'm liking 
stocks to have at least 30 or more. And I might dip a little bit below that 30 number, especially on the short side, because I'm looking at more efficient stocks on the short side, fatter stocks that are more well known. And it's kind of like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But yeah, there's nothing for me in this stock. It, it hasn't barely, it's barely gotten past its old high in here. Even though it's worked its way higher, I can't argue with that. But it's kind of wide and loose. And notice you have, um, excuse me, uh, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> you have gaps kind of all over, like a lot of gaps against the trend. It gaps up, then it comes all the way back in. It just kind of trades in chunks. You know, again, uh, I bring you back to like a, a textbook set up like LMF, LFMD. This thing just took off and it made this beautiful pullback. Now, it did chop around quite a bit, but it didn't stop us out, so we stayed with it. What else are we long? K and F. So K and F, it, it looked that. It went straight up, and then it had a deep pullback, and then it began to take off again. And it seems to be defining gravity in, in spite of it now being in a not-so-hot sector. Okay, URA, jumped past my entry, missed it. Yeah, this one never did pull back enough. and. There's an old adage, you know, bull markets, they don't let you in, bear markets, they don't let you out. And it seems like that's been the case with uranium. And there's a part of me, and maybe an ETF, you know, maybe for shits and giggles, a couple hundred shares or whatever, a thousand shares, I don't know. Maybe buy some and just hold on and close my eyes because it's going up. But but that doesn't sound like much of a strategy in and of itself. So I would wait for it to set up, and it will. I think once we get a really serious knockout move and, you know, pick your favorite uh, uranium stock. I'm trying to think of a few of them off the top of my head. You, Roy. Roy. <laughs> this one's a little wide and loose, but it's gotten its act together as of late. So I think these uraniums could could work really well eventually. So, Keith, just be patient on those. Lab D, I'm not a huge fan of of holding these leveraged shares overnight but there are times like what would be tqqq like uh, one of my clients when when i went long the Qs, he went long tqqq i don't know where he is now but holding leverage shares longer term especially on the short side let me show you something take a look at sqqq and let's take a look at a take a look at like a monthly chart okay so SQQQ was at a half a million, and now it's at 20, okay? So there's a there's sort of a natural decay, so to speak, in these inverse short ETFs. And the reason is when a market goes down, they have to take that surplus of cash and short again, and it has a reverse Martingale effect. And hopefully that makes some sense. By the way, I... I almost hate to give this up, but because uh, one of my clients gave it to me, but uh, you can short the SQQQ, which is which can be pretty damn cool when the market goes up. I shorted a little today. It didn't work. Uh, I got to watch how I say that. It sounds like I said I sharted a little today. <laughs> All right. Any more? Any more stocks you guys want to talk about? Any questions? I don't. I might get in trouble doing this, but let me see if I could um, let me see if I could uh, pop up YouTube real quick. Yeah, I don't know how to get there. Anything else? Any questions? Going once, going twice. Let's see. Oops, don't do that. So. Well, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, you can find me at davelander.com slash contact. To everyone here tonight, I think is in the Facebook group. Everyone here tonight, have a, uh, I'll see you, uh, see you guys tomorrow. Everybody else, have a great weekend, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.